<clears throat> so a few slides here that were rather busy as we started out our chapter, just kind of giving us the bird's eye view of what's gonna, what's gonna happen here. So these are some of the questions that you'll see on your exam, sort of like the nuts and bolts, making sure that you understand that lysozyme is an enzyme that's gonna break glycosidic bonds. So some of your homework problems really um, sort of reinforce that, thinking about uh, what the polymer substrate is, what the linkage is, um, what the enzyme is, and sort of a little bit of detail about where that enzyme is located in terms of what it does. So all of the reactions that we're going to see, even the carbonic anhydrase one, involves water. So the polymer hydrolysis reactions really are using water to break apart a linkage. So again, the linkage in our carbohydrate polymers is glycosidic bonds, so we're going to have lysozyme that does that. DNA and RNA having phosphodiester bonds are going to be using uh, RNase A. And I should say RNase A is really just for uh, RNA here. Protein or amide bonds are going to be um, cleaved by serine proteases. And big picture, you know, why is something like this important? A lot of these enzymes that we're going to talk about are ones that live in your gastrointestinal tract. Remembering that only monomers can be taken up from your, uh, your uh, GI tract and uh, delivered into your bloodstream. If we have consumed fuels that are polymers, we need to have ways of breaking them down into their monomeric form to allow them to exit the GI tract. So amino acids are going to be able to help in the active site of these enzymes do some chemistry. So all of the times when we did our reaction mechanisms and I told you, no, nope, we can't just show PT for proton transfer. I want you to show me the addition or the removal of protons. That's because we're going to map now on enzyme active sites where the, there can be amino acids that can help. So again, to add or remove protons, we need to have um, residues that have reasonable pKa values. So again, you need to be able to know your single letter codes. So we've got our acidic residues, our glutamate and our aspartic acid. We've got histidine, we've got lysine, and we've got arginine. So we've got our five kind of charged, either basic or acidic amino acids. Note here that these are gonna be strange letters. That's why they're hard to remember. But remember, the prevalence of, um, uh, of an amino acid dictates whether it gets sort of the starting letter of its name. So the fact that these are the strange letters reminds us that these are not found very often. And that's significant, right? Because nature is just not going to throw these really important uh, amino acids that can participate in chemistry just all over the place. So when we think about stabilizing uh, by providing a charge, it's going to be these same five residues. The um, acidic ones, which are going to be negatively charged, so they can stabilize something positively charged. The positively charged basic residues are going to be able to stabilize something that's negatively charged. So again, in this case, if we're talking about stabilizing something by providing an opposite charge, that is a way that we can decrease the transition state energy, stabilizing that. Another way that amino acids can help is maybe they can act in a nucleophilic capacity. Maybe they could act, if we're doing a lot of hydrolysis chemistry, maybe they could act like they were water, like a hydroxide group. And serine and threonine are gonna be what are capable of doing that, right? Serine and threonine having hydroxyl groups. So just highlighting here, serine proteases are called serine proteases because we have a catalytically active serine in the enzyme active site that acts as a surrogate to water and actually does the initial chemistry on our substrate. So a lot of enzymes that do chemistry, and if we think about just our basic fuel metabolism equation, right, we're gonna be oxidizing fuels. So clearly we need to be thinking about doing redox chemistry when we think about doing redox chemistry, the amino acid side chains are not really equipped to do that. They don't have the functionality that's going to allow for that. That's where we see coenzymes come in. Coenzymes really can be thought about as the teeth for enzymes, right? So coenzymes are things like NADH and FADH2 when we think particularly about the redox chemistry that happens with this fuel equation. But again, these guys really are important because they are some of our B vitamins. So one of the things that we introduce in this chapter, and that's going to become important for your last two fundamental tests that we'll have after this next exam, is going to be on vitamins and then hormones. So important things. Again, your fundamental tests were on functional groups, were on amino acids, were on, B, were on vitamins, and then are going to be on hormones. And so those are kind of some big picture things uh, that we want to make sure that we uh, are well equipped to sort of think about and talk about. What we're gonna do now is we've got three slides here that are gonna highlight how enzymes work by looking at the uncatalyzed reaction and kind of mapping things on. 
So I know these slides were really busy and we went through them fairly slowly in class. I'm going to try to go a little bit more quickly since this is just a review. But what we have shown in black in all of these slides is the substrates that we're going to be doing chemistry on. Sometimes we're actually going to be drawing out the actual substrate like we have here with a little dye, um, dinucleotide of RNA. Sometimes we might be showing what we kind of showed on our reaction mechanism, so very generic using R's. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we're going to see here is some important things that I want to highlight. In blue, we're going to kind of show here that anytime we had um, protonation or deprotonation events happen. Those represent positions that maybe we could have an amino acid that's going to serve in one of these additional uh, addition or removal of proton capacities. So that's why it was important to think about drawing those bases or drawing those acids out because anytime we show one of those that represents in this case a place where a general acid could help in this case where a general base could help. And the reason we use general is we're just saying that we're not identifying who it is at this point. We're saying that that could be sort of a general base that's helping here. Once we get into the enzyme active sites, we'll actually see that there are specific amino acids that kind of operate in this, in this function. So the other thing that we have here shown in purple is three steps that are really important that we need to think about with every enzyme active site that we look at. The first thing that we need to think about is that an enzyme active site must perform chemistry on the substrate. So for all of these um, hydrolysis reactions that we're going to be looking at, that's basically cleaving whatever the linkage was. So in this case, cleaving the phosphodiester bond. The second thing that we need to make sure that we do is use all of our reagents. And in generally in this case, that means we're doing hydrolysis reactions, so we need to make sure that we see and use water in our enzyme active site. And then importantly, we need to make sure that the enzyme is returned to its active state. It doesn't really make any sense to have an enzyme just do chemistry once and then not be able to do it again. That's really inefficient. So this is also what we refer to as kind of turnover when we talk about removing products from the enzyme active site so it can do its chemistry again. But beyond just making the seat available for a new substrate to bind, we need to make sure that all of the amino acids are returned to their proper active state. So looking at what we have here again with RNA hydrolysis, RNA hydrolysis happens because we have this built-in internal nucleophile that can nucleophilically attack the electrophilic phosphorus of our phosphodiester bond. Again, we're not drawing out full mechanisms here, but we'd form this pentacoordinate intermediate, which would decompose, and then we'd have departure of this three prime portion of our nucleic acid, and we would generate this cyclic phosphate intermediate, 2 prime, 3 prime cyclic phosphate intermediate. At this point, we'd have our downstream RNA, our 3 prime RNA, would diffuse out of the enzyme active site, and water would be able to diffuse in. But even just after this first step, we've really only done chemistry on the substrate. We haven't yet used water, and if we thought about the fact that an amino acid might be helping here, and in this case acting as an acid to protonate our leaving group here or acting as a base to deprotonate this 2 prime hydroxyl, they're not going to be in the right form. This guy is going to be protonated when he needs to be deprotonated. And similarly, this acid down here is going to be in the deprotonated form. But what we can see is a common theme that we see here with our enzyme active sites. We sort of see two acts to our play. In the first act, we're going to see chemistry on the substrate. And oftentimes, it's some type of an internal nucleophile that sort of helps with that chemistry. Water's going to come in in the second act, and water's going to do two things. Not only is it going to help regenerate the enzyme active site, but it's going to finally kind of satisfy the fact that we're using all of these reagents. So water kind of comes in in the second act of the play here. Usually, it will, by its nature, regenerate the enzyme active site but it'll in this case regenerate or generate our final product, which is our upstream um, uh, uh, nucleotide substrate, which can also then diffuse out of the enzyme active site. So I know that was a lot to kind of highlight there. Hopefully it made sense that this is a little bit of a review, but again, we're gonna be seeing a lot of these hydrolysis reactions. So we're gonna need to see water as a reagent. We need to make sure we use that as a reagent. Most of these are gonna show chemistry on the substrate happening in the first act before we've even used water but then water is going to come in to uh, be not only utilized because we need to use it, but it's, it's going to be responsible for regenerating the enzyme into its active state.
So another one of our linkages that we need to think about kind of hydrolyzing is a glycosidic bond that we'd have in carbohydrates. So in this case, we're not actually drawing out carbohydrates, we're actually drawing the acetal or ketal. And again, an acetal or ketal is gonna be determined by whether this is a hydrogen or another um, R group that's there. So again, when we have our acetal here, remember this represents our cyclized sugar. So this is the anomeric bond. This is how we've cyclized our sugars. How we polymerize our sugars together is through this glycosidic bond. So the glycosidic bond is responsible for polymerization. The anomeric bond is responsible for cyclization. So again, some of these things are gonna be those small details that you'll see on your in-class exam, kind of thinking about the bonds that are responsible for either polymerization or cyclization. The sessile bond, this might be the first time that we've said this term here, the sessile bond refers to the bond to be cleaved. So if we think about cleaving this glycosidic bond, how we did this in our reaction mechanisms is we protonated this group to make it a good leaving group. We had an internal nucleophile that pushed it out, and then we had water come in, react with this very electrophilic intermediate here to generate our final product. Glycosidic bond has been cleaved. We now just have the hemiacetal or the hemiketal, again, likened to the cyclized sugar. Same thing that we see here. These three steps need to, uh, need to occur. In the sort of the first half of this play, we saw chemistry on the substrate. Again, by protonating this guy to make him a good leaving group, we could have an internal nucleophile push it out, and we've generated our cleaved glycosidic bond before we've even involved water. Water again is gonna come in, it's gonna help regenerate the enzyme active site because if this residue acted as an acid in the first step to protonate this guy to make him a good leaving group, he can be regenerated in this active form by serving as a base in the second step and that also helps increase the nucleophilicity of water to attack this electrophilic um, intermediate here and again generate our final product. So we're gonna see some chemistry here for lysozyme that allows us to understand how this chemistry works. Last sort of hydrolysis reaction is peptide hydrolysis. So again, in this case, we did actually draw out a little peptide bond here. So again, having a, uh, this peptide bond here, we're gonna see in our uncatalyzed reaction, what we really showed here was maybe deprotonation of our water to make it a better nucleophile. Nucleophilic attack on this carbonyl carbon generates a tetrahedral intermediate. Tetrahedral intermediate can decompose, protonate our leaving group, and we're gonna generate our cleaved product here. So one of the things that we wanna think about is, and again, that's just looking at the black and the red that we have there. What would happen if we didn't see water early on here? What if we saw a water surrogate? What if we saw serine? So let's map through here. What if this was not an H2O residue, but if it was a serine that has a hydroxyl group? Nucleophilic attack and generation of a tetrahedral intermediate would now have a serine that's covalently attached to our substrate here in this tetrahedral intermediate. We'd still need to see protonation of this um, leaving group here, but decomposition of the tetrahedral intermediate will now have not a hydroxyl group here, but serine in our enzyme that's covalently attached to the N-terminal portion of our, of our peptide. C-terminal portion could then depart, and at this point, we're left with an upstream N-terminal peptide that's still covalently attached to our enzyme. The C-terminal peptide can depart. Now at this part, we don't really have it shown here on this uncatalyzed reaction, but we need to actually repeat this sequence of events. Now having water come in to act as a nucleophile, attack this, generate a tetrahedral intermediate, decompose that, and now allow serine to leave. That's what we need to do to not only involve water, but also regenerate the enzyme active site. So serine proteases are going to be one of the, the more involved sort of enzyme active sites that we're going to see because we actually have to do this process twice.